about you know these changes in capitalism and in nature of capitalism what we see today is a prominent role of you know this neoliberal think tanks these foundations these institutions that push in the political debate you know some topics what do you think that these institutions have made to the capitalist society and what's their role in promoting some agendas? I think their main role is ideological. Uh, the promotion of individualism where we are simply responsible for ourselves, right? Which of course works against any form of socialized or collectivized activity including unions right not to mention socialist parties or communist parties or whatever right uh, that I think is the main idea because when you examine the neoliberal program which goes back to the 1930s that's when neoliberalism originates And it originated specifically to attack, surprisingly, well, not maybe not surprisingly, Keynes. Right? Even before the general theory. I, I wrote a paper on this, and when I did the research, I was, I was astounded to discover the early uh, attacks on Keynes coming from what are now the neoliberal, well, most of them, are, all of them are dead from the 1930s, but uh, the neoliberal camp, Lionel Robbins, of course, Hayek is very prominent, but uh, uh, any number of philosophers, um, uh, Carl Poyani's brother, uh, Michael Poyani, right, who was a chemist and a philosopher, sort of philosopher, uh, Jacques Rueff, Yeah. You know, European yeah. Union. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Ludwig Erhard, Germany uh, in the post World War II period, right? And because the neoliberal program is interesting, it, I, it, it's hard to really call it a program beyond the ideological. Uh, because the programs differ from area to area. European neoliberalism is not the same as U.S. neoliberalism. Uh, the, um, what is it called, indicative planning of France in the post-World War II period, that was a neoliberal program. Planning, right? Not socialist planning or Soviet planning or whatever, but uh, the social market in Germany, a neoliberal program. And when you hear a social market, you, you know, The market is to be constrained by the interests of larger society. That's the, at least, ideological uh, aspect to it, right? Uh, well, that doesn't sound neoliberal. It sounds sort of quasi-socialist, right? But in fact, given the German situation, and given the experiences of the 1930s and fascism and what have you, Right, uh, a constrained market was politically necessary in that period of time, in the post World War II period of time. Right, so we have these different forms of neoliberalism, but all of them are designed to promote the interest of capital. Right, and uh, directed against the interest of workers. Right, so. Yeah, and, and they have worked very hard. I applaud them because starting from a very tiny group of people back in the 1930s, they worked very hard at organizing themselves, as putting forward their theoretical arguments. And of course, places like the University of Chicago were very 
important for this, right? Because a lot of the neoliberal economics comes out of Chicago, and they set up these uh, study groups to examine, you know, what, what should our position be on the trade union? What should our position be on monopoly? What should our position be? Go back to uh, the classical liberal position. Uh, are you familiar with Henry Simons, University of Chicago, 1940s? Very prominent economist at the time. He was a classical liberal. If you're a classical liberal, you're anti-monopoly. And he was dead set against monopoly, right? When George Stigler came to the uh, University of Chicago in the late 40s, he was anti-monopoly. Now, George Stigler was an early member of the Mont Pelerin Society, right? In fact, he was an officer, I think president of the Mont Pelerin Society at one point, if I recall correctly. In any case, Chicago sets up this study group on monopoly. What do you do with monopoly, right? Can you continue to criticize it? The answer is no. Because... If monopoly exists, you know, if if the if the world is the search for efficiency, if the economy is the search for efficiency, and monopolies exist, they must be efficient. So that's the justification, right? So the old classical liberal liberal position, which is anti-monopoly, is modified on the basis of good neoclassical economic principles, efficiency and now becomes supported. So a lot, you know, this is when the Law and Economics program was established in the 1950s at the University of Chicago. And people like uh, Coase and uh, Aaron Director and uh, etc. Poser, th they were all part of that. Right? And uh, Coase was uh, he, came, he comes out of the London School of Economics in the 1930s and the London School of Economics was one of the two main academic institutions where neoliberalism was formulated, right? It's surprising how many people think of the uh, LSE as left-wing, right? A socialist uh, stronghold, right? Yeah. Uh, no, this is, you know, this is... And the other was that Swiss university, the uh, Institute for Higher Studies. I can't remember the, the whole name. Uh, but, uh, and this is where von Mises was at the time in the 1930s, right? Uh, Jacob Viner was there, although Jacob Viner had a problem with neoliberalism. Uh, and that's why he left Chicago and went to Princeton. But in any case, yeah, so it goes back to the 1930s. There's no necessary agreement. Uh, if you if you if you read about the Mont Pelerin Society and the debates that they had uh, and continue to have, right? There's no necessary agreement as to a specific program, and it has to accommodate different forms of capitalism, right? So you you're not going to have agreement on the program, but ideologically, yes, right? And then the ideology has to be modified to accommodate those different social structures, Germany versus the United States, Italy versus Canada, you know, whatever, right? Uh, so you see different forms of it, but has it been successful? Yeah, because the organizations have been successful. These guys work very hard at organizing and putting forward, developing their think tanks, developing their publications, making the political context, making the contacts with the media. And they tell you, you know, if you read their stuff, they tell you what they have done. Uh, and they've done it very well. So in that sense, I applaud them, right? Uh, the other side has not done very well. <laughs> done, done terribly, in fact, just awfully. <laughs>